Hey y'all, my name is Shan. Welcome to Cozy Room Podcast. This is a series for Black fathers because Black fathers matter. Black fathers matter to me. Black fathers matter to my children. Black fathers matter when it comes to my brothers, um, my mentors, my friends. They matter because they set the tone for who our children look up to. They set the tone for how men, women, children, and other elderly people feel protected, feel like, you know, everything they've struggled for was for a good cause because they've seen who they've been become. And I want to, um, I don't know, I just want to shine a light on them and hear from them in a perspective that sometimes goes unheard because no one cares to ask. Sometimes people look at fathers as if, oh, that's nothing. They're supposed to do that. Why would we, you know, thank you for doing something you're automatically supposed to do? You shouldn't look for any, you know, praise or any uh, thank yous for that. That's the standard. That's the basics. You know, do what you're supposed to do. But when you have a father that's there, that's consistent, that's uh, available, that's attentive, that's caring, that's thoughtful versus an absent father versus a father that thinks his life and his now is more important than the child's future. Um, there's a difference. There's a clear difference. And I just want to show appreciation. So uh, this series, I've interviewed many, many fathers from different places, different backgrounds. And I really just want to pick their brains with different questions. So um, thank you for listening to Cozy Boom Podcast. And I hope you enjoy. Hey, guys, welcome back to Cozy Boom Podcast. My name is Shan. And this is the Black Fathers Matter series, not because I believe they don't matter, but because I believe they do and they don't get like the proper, you know, appreciation. So I'm appreciating them all month. So all month of June, these episodes will be about Black fathers out here making that thing a verb. And um, the father I have for you tonight is Will from Brooklyn and um, I call him the wise man because he's always like reading or always having knowledge of or always you know sharing sharing the wealth from the brain up top and uh, I appreciate it and I think that's how people grow because they just learn more and they just do more in their um, experience and more and they share. And the key word is sharing tonight and he is sharing a different side of himself. You know, we're digging in deep on fatherhood and he's being very honest and open. And uh, that is key for this the discussion. So I hope you guys enjoy. Peace. Wait, 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 wait. Before we get into this episode... Let's show some support. Let's go. Hey, guys. The black business I would like to support for this episode is Cafe Con Libros. It's in Brooklyn, New York. Since our guest is from Brooklyn, I suggest, you know, I was like, you know what? This this is fitting. We're going to do it. So Cafe Con Libros, BK.com. C-A-F-E-C-O-N. L I B R O S B K dot com. It's a feminist bookstore, right? And a little cute coffee shop. And it's cute. I love the uh, decor. I like how it's very like um, inviting. Uh, you could go there, pick up books, read books, share books online. They sell books online, which is cool. You have um, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria by Beverly Daniel Tatum. You have Angela Davis books. You have books for um, children. You get to see what um, article is new that they're promoting or they're talking about. 
they tell you about you know their shop online it's just very cute it's on 724 prospect place brooklyn new york 11 to 16 if you would like to email them you can email them at info at cafe con libros bk.com and their phone number is 347-460-2838 so if you're interested in supporting a black business You know, take your family there real quick in the morning or on a Sunday or on a Saturday or just during the week and decompress at a bookstore. Get you some coffee, you know, get your aura right, you know, center those chakras and just chill out and support a black business. Thank you for being great and let's get into the show. But I think I, I think he thought he was gonna catch me off guard. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is episode seven. You're my seventh dad of the month, and um, this is the Black Fathers Matter series for Closed Room Podcast. My name is Shan, and we have Will here. Hey guys, William, Sir William. Ah, taking bong rips. Feeling good. Oh, man. Um, would you like to tell the people where you're from? Wow, where am I from? I am from New York City. I am a melanated American mm. from uh, America, the state of New York, the city of New York, yeah. born in the borough of Brooklyn, raised in the borough of Harlem. Well, the village of Harlem. And uh, I live in Brooklyn again. So, yeah. Well, welcome back home. I know, right? <laughs> what is your age currently? And how do you, what age do you feel? Or how do you feel? Oh, um, I am 35, you know, based off the Mayan calendar. And um, I feel, I feel 30. Okay. Yeah, I can still kick some ass out here. Okay. I mean, need, if need be. You got to do it, you know. <laughs> um, What does being a father mean to you? Hmm. You just want to start with the heavy questions? I mean, I thought that was kind of light. No, that's, that's the everything right there. That's beautiful. Yeah. All right, being a father is um, it's the best thing that ever happened in, in life. Mm. Um, it's the best investment I ever made into my future. Mm-hmm. Which sounds crazy. It's like your best investment was like dropping off some semen, but it was. Yeah, it is. It was. It was. Um, it was everything to make me better. Mm-hmm. It 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 forced me to be better. So fatherhood is everything it's it's the promise to be better than I was fathered Mm -hmm. Um, it's a commitment to be better than you know my peers as fathers Mm -hmm. better than society as a whole as fathers Um, yeah that's I love it it's the most interesting thing I've ever had to do but the most rewarding. Uh, how was your relationship with your father growing up? Um, it was an odd relationship. We didn't have much uh, problems mm-hmm. with each other, but that was mainly because he was so... What's the word for it? Distant? No, very much so right there. Oh. But very strict. Oh very strict so when you know you have someone that's so domineering Mm -hmm. just in in mentally you know physically emotionally you um you're not gonna have much problems with that person especially Mm -hmm. when they they physically outmatch you you know Mm -hmm. so um it was it was it was a weird kind of dynamic because um i was just who he said i was supposed to be 
Mm. So where did you get like your emotional, your um, example of what it is to be vulnerable from? It certainly was not from my dad. I only seen my dad vulnerable maybe once or twice. He was, um, I think he was burying his sister or his father. Cause we had, it was a lot of deaths in the family consecutively. So I seen my father be the person that give that talk at the uh, burial wow. a few times. And that, that's when I seen him vulnerable. Otherwise he, he, it was no vulnerability coming from him. Everything was masculine. Everything was pan-African. Everything was man shit. Hmm. What quality do you see now in your fatherhood that you like, dang, now I understand why my dad did this, or I understand my dad a little bit more because of this. Like, what is it? Um, this is the funniest thing, right? That's a weird, the answer for that is going to be super weird. Okay. Because what I learned from my father the most um, is to be open and to be communicative. Because he wasn't? Well, because he killed himself. Wow. Right? So I guess he suffered from anxiety early in life. Yeah. Um, But no one ever like said it was depression. No one ever diagnosed him. And say, yeah, you're depressed or you're bipolar or, you know, you, you're nothing was clinically, you know, put on him. Mm-hmm. And um, at the time, I mean, you know, black people don't really, we didn't really fuck with mental health too tough. Right. Back in the 90s. So a man was just going to go through what a man went through until he couldn't go through it no more. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that was the demise of my father. Like he went through everything he could until he hit a breaking point and uh, he departed himself from this uh, earth. How old were you when that happened? I was 14. Jeez. Yeah, 14. Mm. It was crazy. I, my whole life changed right then. Just everything. Like so, I was like a book dude. Mm-hmm. Like super, you know, I would say like docile, like just very calm and just went by whatever my father said Mm -hmm. after that it was I really got into being myself it was like it was like a weight which is crazy like my father's death was like a weight being released um so was the um was the heaviness of what that meant with him being gone was that something that hit you as soon as that happened or did it hit you like gradually as you're learning ways to not have him there and still cope with life it was, it was gradual it was gradual um the circumstances around when he uh because he it's a weird story he was missing for like a couple months mm-hmm. they found his body but when they finally found his body i was doing something uh pretty special that he um actually was looking forward to seeing me do I was in the boys' choir Harlem, so I sang my whole life. Mm-hmm. And um, he, the year before, he went up to camp with us and he saw a performance. And he said, "You sing alto. When am I gonna see you do a solo?" And I was like, "I don't know. I'm just getting into the performing choir. Like I'm just getting popular. Mm-hmm. People just finding out what I can do. I don't know when I'm gonna do a, do a solo, but I'm gonna try." Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was working on a solo that whole like summer between eighth and ninth grade. Like, and he didn't know, cause you know, I that, that didn't really share what was going on in school with my dad. Like I just kept it to myself. And um, he would have ended up seeing me do that solo, but he, um, he hanged himself, you know, that summer some, in some forest off Long Island. So he just never got a chance to see me perform that solo. But he died, and we were in the midst of like heavy rehearsals for the solo. We were performing with orchestra. It was like the 30th anniversary of my organization, mm-hmm. so this was big. This was like a big celebration, and I had no time to really um, deal with it. Mm-hmm. You know, like he, I went to the service, and I skipped out on the burial because I was 
rehearsing with like a hundred piece orchestra. It was mm-hmm. like, and I just, I, I didn't even have time to process it. I was like, it's like, do you still want to do this solo? I'm like, hell yeah, I want to do it. Yeah. Like, I'm the only person that's going to do this shit. Nobody else is doing this. Mm-hmm. And I just like put my head down and kept going. I actually got that from him. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just like one of his, one of his traits, but yeah, man, I didn't really get a chance to process that shit until later, and that's when I really changed um, who I was and how I, uh, just how I navigated. I, I promised never to be angry again, which is unnatural. I had to fix myself from that. Yeah. But um, one thing I did promise myself was that I'll share, and I'll never, I'll, I'll never, like, guard that part of my life from anyone. Cause it, it's, it's no need to like, like that's something that we can all learn from. Right. Like, open yourself up, be emotional, be vulnerable to people that surround you, the people you care about, but also possibly to anybody. Mm. And does that make you a better? Do you feel like that makes you a better father for your son? Um. Yeah, because I I do the best I can not to be domineering or controlling like I I don't want to control his life I just want to like executive produce it you know like I just I just want to put the I just want to give you the platform to do what you do you know so that I think (laughs) I didn't even let you introduce your son but I I just know of Tiles that you have a son Um, yeah do you share stories of your dad with your son? Often? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, would it be often? It's it's as often as something comes up that makes sense to share a story. Okay. You know, like when when things, certain things happen, or if we talk about you know construction, or if we're talking about being in business for yourself, or mm-hmm. me, me, well, we have those conversations monthly, at least once or twice a month. We're talking about you know, self-sufficiency, ownership, and, you know, yeah. what what those things look like. So, yeah. Um, I feel like that's, like, a, a life treasure to uh, have a father that, you know, help raise you and give you challenges as needed. And then mm-hmm. within your challenge he had his own challenge that he didn't let anybody know and he wanted to solve it the way he thought it should be solved and then you grow up and you learn that you know he's not the end sayer or the the person that has all the answers because that wasn't the answer for him so he thought and then you grow up and you become a father and then you have a son so it's yeah, like yeah. it's like an instant um with the same instant. name what all of us got the same name i'm william charles moore the third oh, my son is william charles moore the fourth my father's william charles moore jr his father william charles moore wow so and then you, all, you, you get you get to correct it absolutely i get to change the narrative in the cycle so I just want to, I want to raise, the, I told my son, oh, well, me and my wife talk about it to my son. Mm-hmm. We tell him that we wanted to raise the freest black man in America. Mm-hmm. And that was just free in terms of thought, free from commercialism, free from capitalism, free from all of the isms in America that keeps us in like a figurative slavery, mm-hmm. you know, so... I wanted to help him depart from his ego, depart from pride. You know, because those things are pride. You know how many black men need that right now. Yeah, absolutely. The absolutely. struggle. The struggle uh, is real. <laughs> uh, when do you feel the most appreciated from your son? Well, I'm not appreciated at all. I get no respect. <laughs> <laughs> oh man no I uh daily daily it's like a daily thing like we, we talk daily we say we love you 
you know, daily. It's like positive affirmations. Like, I believe in life, even, even if it sounds corny and it's like, yeah, you know I care about you deeply, right? You know I love you. You know I appreciate you. You know I'm proud of you, even if you ain't doing shit to be proud of. Right. I'm just proud that you're here. Mm. You know? So, yeah, we... I feel appreciated every day. I feel the least appreciated on Father's Day, though. Why? Because I don't get shit. Because it's like a day made to show out and you don't feel like people are putting the effort... I don't, I don't want nobody to put anything into like these made up holidays but that's that's when I feel the least appreciated when it's supposed to be like the world's appreciation oh that's not that like cause I'm I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting love every day you know what I'm saying yeah that's that that's the day for that extraness yeah I just I be like yo that's the day where you could just leave me alone Okay, so your ideal Father's Day would be to be left alone. Yeah, I don't need to be celebrated. Like, I'm a father, like, every single day. Okay. Like, to the best of my ability, I'm a father every day. So I don't I don't need the celebration. I don't really need the gifts. Like, mm-hmm. I, I hate that people don't talk to you all year. But then it's like, it's Father's Day. It's like, hmm, let me think of all the fathers in my life. Let me fake it to make it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just everybody yeah. hitting you up like, yo, happy Father's Day, bro. And then all the girls on, happy Father's Day, King. Like, shut yeah. up. You don't know me. You don't know if I'm a good father or not. Like, you just, you may yeah. like me personally. You may like my mm-hmm. persona, my online persona. Mm-hmm. You know, my, my cyber character. But get out of here. <laughs> like, I, I don't need it. Oh, man. Um... Being a dad means these three things to me. What are they? Uh, being a, a dad means being honest, open, and considerate. I like that. Those are like super like lame. They're like, oh, yeah. No, it's true. Um, I get on my brother about this all the time where he'll, they have this like oh I'm gonna like go in on you or you know I'm gonna make fun of you because I like you or I care thing going on and I'm just like why y'all gotta be like that like why y'all have to you know tease in order to show that y'all care about each other like what is that about and it's all this deflecting that my brother does. And then his kids are like super emotional with me because I'm aunt, I'm their aunt. But at the same time, they be having questions on why he's like how he is. And, <laughs> and I'm, just, you how he get like this. I'm just like, yo, your dad is such a softy. He's such a softy, but he tries to put up this like hard outer shell like he's not bothered and you know his feelings don't exist and it it does and I'm just like what is that about so I try to like balance them out to where they feel comfortable being open and being honest with people despite you know what their dad may do or not do so it's just gotcha. I'm just like man that is so unnecessary um see what was the feeling you got when your son was born when you first saw him and held him like what was that like oh man the anxiety started before the birth because I was there all night <laughs> were you a fainting dad don't tell me you was a fainting nah, dad nah, nah, nah I'm too big to be falling out <laughs> um I definitely didn't think, but it was just like so much concern because I know, well, I didn't really know back then, but I just have a lack of trust for the medical profession and for for just how they treat black women. Understandable. Like, yeah. Plus, you know, my father didn't have me. That, this is why I am the way I am. Mm-hmm. My dad really done put me on to a lot of, uh, a lot of heavy literature. Mm-hmm. 
uh, early in my life. So when, when we got to that, it was like a little distrust. It was a lot of distrust, actually. Yeah. Um, I knew we definitely didn't want to do a C-section. We wanted to do natural birth. It was up to uh, my wife if she um, wanted to do it with the epidural or if she wanted to do it completely natural. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I left it up to her, but, you know, it was a lot of anxiety because I wanted to make sure that she was actively um, expressing the pain that she was going through. Like, there's no reason why you need to try to feel tough or mm-hmm. stronger than you need to be when dealing with this pain. Like, if it's a nine, say it's a nine. You don't have to, you don't have to say it's a five, you know? Um, so the, the anxiety was up from there. Yeah. But when he was, when he actually came out, um, first of all, I ain't never seen it spread like that. Hey, what is this? Cream cheese or butter? This is a like, last yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like, listen, like they were losing his um his his, his uh, levels, so they came and they was like, "We're not able to read his levels. We should go for emergency C-section." And I was like, "The fuck you will!" Yeah. Like there has to be another way to to monitor him. So they had to put the little catheter on his head to the cervix or whatever to to keep his his levels. And um, he was coming out, and I I knew it was coming because. Wasn't so much more cord or wire left. Yeah, I seen it. I seen it, and um, yeah, just to see it like just just mm-hmm. open up like that is just that was interesting. But when his whole body was out, and I cut the uh, umbilical cord, it was just like, yo, like this is I've I fulfilled the prophecy, so yeah. to speak. Like I've fulfilled my duties as a human like right now like right now I mean I'm not done but I procreate yeah like I brung a person to the world like I felt super accomplished in life I was good anything else after this would just be to keep that life going right you know what I mean it didn't matter about me it didn't matter if I had achieve any success yet or if you know I was doing what I loved none of that shit mattered it was like yo like I'm good like yeah. whatever I gotta do to make sure that he can eat and he has like a platform mm-hmm. um and he, he never has to get off the pedestal mm-hmm. and I mean I'm holding him up I'm good so yeah that was so both of I them were like healthy shit. and everything after yeah everybody was good Everybody was good. No goddamn C sections. See, you know. I like I like that there's a black man out here, a black father that knows the difficulty and the seriousness of what it is to be a black woman in labor. Yo, listen, um I can't remember the dude's name because he's not important, he's mm-hmm. horrible. But the um I guess what you would call the godfather of modern gynecology. Yes. Uh, he, the shit that he did to black women, yeah, um, is just is just horrible. Mm-hmm. And for him to be so influential, influential in in how we operate today, mm-hmm. like his 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 thoughts, his findings mm-hmm. are they 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 have been published. Mm-hmm. They've been published by the in American, you know. What's that? The med- American medicine, whatever. It's like they um, gloss they gloss over the monstrous things that he's done to black women. They to have highlight. they have these statues of like appreciation. It's just like yeah. But did you read the facts though? Did you see the instruments that he created to just? go in there and abuse black women sexually just to see what it looked like or what it could what do. What it looked like, bro. Yeah. Like, um, that shit is terrible. I think that's why a lot of people who are doulas struggle with getting an insurance company to pay them on a somewhat level of a doctor because whether you're a doctor helping bringing in life or you're a doula, it's still a lot of responsibility on you. 
Absolutely. And I feel like <clears throat> doulas, um, they do more because they're with you every step of the way until that child comes out and then what you do after the child. So um, I've, I've interviewed a few doulas before and uh, I just wish that they had like their own lawyers who were for doulas, um, their own like insurance company that backed doulas, but that's something they still working through, I guess. Yeah. That's, that's gonna be tough. They 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 want us all to the jail with Western medicine. They want us all to go through Western medicine and, and the, the systems that have been created. It's, yeah. it's tough. So I just quit my hospital job. I can't be a part of it. <laughs> my mom, uh, she had five of us, all vaginally, all without med. When she was in labor with me, she was reading a book and the doctor threw it across the room. So each time I was in labor, my mom was there. And she always was like, girl, get up and squat. And I'm just like, well, they didn't tell me I could get up and squat. She's like, just get up and squat. She was like, it's gravity. That's why your labor is taking so long. So you have a Jamaican short little lady on the side. And these doctors in here just making this just the longest, the longest labor <laughs> ever. I'm just like, man, if only I squatted, this probably be like five hours earlier. But yeah, it's a challenge. Should have squatted, man. Should have did a couple oh, squats. Man, too late. But we're not going back there. <laughs> um, what's your biggest challenge so far being a black father? Hmm. Being a black father, biggest challenge. The biggest challenge is, is is what is is just the same as being a black man in America. You know, like without being a black father, it's it's just the world's indifference to like whether you're there or not. Like we we get the jokes, like you know, black kids don't have fathers, and you know, black fathers not there, like. But it's not even really the reality. Right. It's actually just jokes. And those jokes really stem from the 90s when they signed that crime bill and put all our daddies away. Mm -hmm. So it's not like that anymore. Fathers are, black fathers are, are present and active. Right. But that's the, that's the biggest, the biggest challenge is the world being able to see you seriously as a black father. You know, just I don't like the indifference, like, cause I don't, I'm not worried about people on a daily basis. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm gonna get done things I need to get done. But when I see so, so, uh, socially, we get kind of overlooked. We we're, we're t treated with indifference. You know, black fathers are not celebrated because there's too many of us who have not been fathers. Too many black men who may not have been fathers or. Uh, too many black men have dealt with too many black women who have enough of a voice on the internet that it kind of dominates like the mm -hmm. thought of black fatherhood. Um, and then those guys who haven't been a good example, they, they create the, the stage for the skepticism with black fatherhood as well. Like, so that's the biggest, the biggest challenges are that my, some of my brothers have not done right. And, um, there's this like historic like kind of rumor that black fathers are not there. Those are the biggest challenges because otherwise. That's a rumor and I don't think people understand like there's a lot of there's a lot behind why a father might not be in a household. Oh, you yeah. know once they get you locked up and you get released they tell you where you can and can't live. You can't live with your family because in order for your family to be able to take care of the kids, the house, the bills, something's going to be taken away because you are now back in the household. So yeah. now it's kind of like your household is tainted. Then um, if the father is in the household and just like, forget it, you know, we'll struggle. You're really going to struggle because that man is now limited on what job he can have how much he can make and then 
if you went mm-hmm. before you went into prison and you did jail time you know how quick you could get money but you can't do that anymore because you want to be there for your family so it's all these struggles from everywhere when it comes to yes being a black man in a household and trying yes. to one make up for the time you miss to show that woman that you're with that you're a man that you can provide and three figure out your purpose in it because i don't i've never been to jail i've never been to prison i don't know what it's like to do time and then come back and and try to find your footing but i can only imagine like it's an out of body experience yeah um I, i mean i don't know either from yeah. experience but from seeing people come home, I mean, especially those that are fathers, it's like, ooh, it's like so much pressure. Mm-hmm. It's so much pressure. You can you can see it. It's like, it's, it's really, really life or death. It's like, they have that kind of, like, spark in their eyes because, you know, it's, they got to do something. Yeah. They got to do something to feed their kid. They got to do something to make sure that that they want me to feel secure with them there. They have to have to do a lot. And you know, hmm. the world don't make it easy. Sure don't. Um, what's one thing mothers will never understand about fatherhood or being a father? Hmm. <laughs> it's an interesting question. One thing that mothers will never understand about being Yo, that I'm like I'm a little stumped. This is that's a that's a deep ass question. That's a simple for, question, like, but there's so many answers you can whoa. give for it. That's deep right there. Like. I, I think I think um the black mothers, the the women's, the black beautiful melanated queens of the world. Right. You guys will never understand. Um. You'll never understand how it really feels to be a black father, a black father, because you can't internalize those pressures. Like you can see them and you can recognize them, but you you will never be able to feel that pressure. The same way we will never be able to feel the pressure of being a black woman or the anxiety that comes with that, or being a woman in general. Like we'll ne- men will never understand what it's like. It's, yeah. We don't worry about being attacked, kidnapped, abducted, like almost ever. Yeah. Right? So we'll never feel that that emotion. Um, women and black women will never feel the pressure that we have to deal with. Like to, to essentially not be, um, to not present yourself to people in a way that scares them, even though that that internalized fear always exists for black men. Like, you still have to try not to be a scary nigga. Yeah. Um, and that's in your house, too. That's in your house as well as outside your house. Mm-hmm. You know, because you, you never want to rule by fear. Right. I don't think ruling by fear makes sense in a, in a family, and like a, you know, in your household. Like, that's mm-hmm. not going to be, that's not going to be healthy. That's you know. when you see a man um, not be able to hold his bearings on life when he feels like he has to resort to uh, violent, uh, emotional uh, chopping down someone or uh, just like, you know, I'm going to put my gun on the desk and this going to be the end of the conversation. Because that's how my dad was. My dad was on... Um, um, F you, F your mom, F your auntie, F your sister, anybody come to my house, I'm shooting them while we at Sunday dinner. Like, and that's just how he was. And this is a Jamaican man that owned businesses, went to his Catholic church on Sunday, played his lottery, um, prayed at every meal 
you know what I'm saying? So, uh, and then I have a mom that's like really like calm, hates confrontation, uh, very like shut down ish when things happen. And then I'm just like, girl, if you don't get up, but I too have to respect that that's her, that's how she copes. I too have to respect and acknowledge that that's him. That's how he deals with this. But out of that, it was kind of like, it screwed me up because what I saw as a marriage, what I saw as a family unit, I knew I didn't want at a young age. Mm. So the fact that that was the wrong example, but I was in it and she stayed in it. Fast forward, I'm a mom where I didn't have kids for the purpose of, I want to be a single mom. You know what I'm saying? I had kids because I just felt like this was the right time for me to have kids in order for my mom to enjoy them as a grandmother. Had nothing to do with having a package of the house, the the fence, the cars, the dog, the man. It had nothing to do with that because I'm just like, if that's supposed to happen, that'll come. But from what I've seen out here, I'm not impressed. So I'm good. You Slow, know? Down. <laughs> Slow down. Slow <clears throat> down. But um, Slow down. Believe but, half of what you see. Believe half of what you see, none of what you hear about. <laughs> like, but, you gotta you know, experience that on your own with no expectations and no preconceived notions. Yeah, yeah, so I'm just, you know, I'm really laxed about that. But um, I don't feel like you have to be within that relationship dynamic to be a great father or a great mother. I just feel like that's just something you have to focus in and be intentional about doing. And yeah, so, absolutely. Um, that's what I do. That's what I allow. Um, you said something that made me lead to my next question, whereas you said you don't want to be that scary person in your house. So I think a lot of men don't do that intentionally, but I think men need a better way of decompressing before they go home. It doesn't always have to be with women. Um, <laughs> but how do you decompress from the world and society's pressures before you meet your family, before you see your wife, before you come in the house, so you don't have to stage the whole house of what you're bringing in? Like, how do you decompress? What do you do? Drugs. I mean, there it is. You know, it's funny. I don't. I don't even. My um, I'm so open, right? I'm yeah. such an open book, and like the kind of, the kind of like, dynamic that we have in my household is so open, mm-hmm. and like kind of just like free. Like we're friends in here. Like we might as well just be roommates. Yeah. Right. Like it's like we we respect the space that we respect. Mm-hmm. There's like, there's there's a few boundaries, mm-hmm. you know, that we respect, but. In terms of coming home and decompressing, my wife knows what it is. Yeah. So she's like, it's usually I get off work, she's like, yo, get here as fast as you can. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, facts. And on my way home, yeah, although I'm dealing with, I'm from New York City, so I'm dealing with all kind of racism, like yes. overt, covert, <laughs> just the taxi system, just everything COVID. in New York City, just like COVID, like everything oh, has man. like an element of racism in new york city especially yeah. when it's like yo like there's, there's a lot of slaves buried under new york city yes you know what i'm saying seneca village is central park you know what i'm saying so it's a lot it's a lot in new york city when you aware oh we are not aware is bliss ignorance is bliss Boy. but that's that's if your soul could afford the shit. because yeah. if you find out some some information later in life you were, you might have been walking around here happily, but you find out that information is going to change a lot for you. Yeah. You know, you're, you're going to think about it a lot more as you walk through the city. But um, my wife is just like, listen, get home as fast as possible. When I get here, there'll probably be like, you know, two doobies rolled up, just ready. 
you know, if she's here, if she's not here and she's at work or whatever, like I just come straight in. First thing I do, even if I'm, I'm, I don't know, I don't really get angry too much, but even if I'm a little aggravated or whatever, I just, I knock on my son's door because he's never outside his room. He's just in his dungeon most times. I knock on his door. He opens the door like, he opens up like, yeah, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I want to give you a hug. Yeah. I love you. Yeah. And he's like, I love you too. <laughs> you know, like that little teenage, <laughs> like that teenage thing. And so like, yeah. I just, I hug him and um, I, I ask him about his day. And you know, once I start to engage with him, like the world don't even matter. The world doesn't even matter. So even if, like, I could have just gotten an argument with like somebody, like on the train or mm-hmm. just like in a cab, and it it wouldn't even matter. Because mm-hmm. once I step into my zone, like I get into my domain, and I just, you know, I get to hug my son and talk to him. It doesn't. None of that shit even matters. So like my use, I, I don't want to say I use my family as my decompression method, but That's good, we though. help. We help each other all the time. When my wife comes in from work, she works at the at the garden. Mm-hmm. That's why you know I always got some damn Nick gear. Yeah. She works at the garden, so she's dealing with tens of thousands of people a day. Like her energies, like she's exchanging energies yeah. with tens of thousands. She's coming across them. Um, when she comes in, damn right, the sage needs to burn. Like those clothes need to come off. That sage needs to burn. Mm-hmm. We just need to steam out the bathroom and chill, you know. Yeah. And I'll make sure that she that I roll up some weed for her too. Mm-hmm. Make sure when she comes in, you know, you know the first thing you do when you come in, you most time you gotta take a shit. It's like, okay, yeah. I've been holding this all day. <laughs> I, Especially in New York because there's no bathrooms you trust. You do not want to use nobody's yeah. bathroom in New York City, like. Right. And I don't care if you work there. If you work there, you don't want to use that shit. Right. Though. You come home, the first thing you do is want to take a shit, man. And you know, I just <laughs> <laughs> whoever's at the home base when the other person is coming in, yeah. we make sure we take care of what you know we yeah. could, so that that person could come into a comfortable situation. That's good. It's a mutual respect. Um, I think that's super important. Whether you're um, married, not married, um, co-parenting, that mutual respect. It kills a lot of drama, a lot of unnecessary uh, assumption uh, felt and taken. And it just sets a tone for your household because in New York, it's really important to make your home homey to lock out New York because New York constantly has stuff going on around the clock. Like it's not time to rest. We don't need, you know, these eight hours of rest. New York is constantly going. So when you come in, you want to feel like you're not there in New York. So um, to have a family that does that for you, great. Yeah, we'd be so high, we ain't even in New York no more. (laughs) I need to step into the house, hit one of these. Hit this, here, smoke this. (laughs) Have um, Have you taught your son how to gauge his um, his anger and his output and input with people outside? Um, that is a, a constant, like, conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, like, because how do you how do you represent your frustration? Because when you when you know that the world has this like black man filter on you. Mm-hmm. So they don't see you like they see other people. It's a black man. It's a special filter. And uh, niggas in the mirror are more angrier than they appear. Like, it's like, you know what I'm saying? It's like, they see you and you could be frustrated. But your frustration and their fear mixes and you and they see you as being fucking raving mad. Yeah. So it's just from the beginning, use your words. Mm-hmm. You know, pay attention to your body language because you pay attention to your body language when you're talking to us. If I ask you to do something, I don't want to see you slumping. And, uh, yeah, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. I want, I want you to say, "All right, I'm on it. I'll make sure it gets done." Mm-hmm. Without having to go through the 
Uh, uh, you know, I don't want the wine and I don't want the body language and all that. We pay attention to that every day. So it's like, pay attention to it for sure when you're out in the street. Mm-hmm. You know, if you are approached by police, if you are approached by even like a random stranger, like how do you represent your body language? You never want to look like you're not mature. And like the whole hands in your pocket, head down, kind of slouched. Like, mm-hmm. you know, if you are who you, you are how you carry yourself to the outside world. So before someone gets to speak to you, you know, the way you walk, mm-hmm. the way you represent yourself in the street, how aware you are of your surroundings, like that's, that's who you are to yeah. someone who doesn't know you. So, you know, you're black, <laughs> so you're going to be a scary one. Yeah. But, you know, you, you use your words, you be considerate, you know, you just, it's a daily thing because he does have some, some problems with interacting, mm-hmm. you know, and I think his um, input output with some of his friends, I think that can get a little bit, um, I don't want to say toxic because toxic is such like an overused word right now, mm-hmm. but it can, well, and problematic is an overused yeah, word too. Let me, let me put out my synonyms, my, syn- <laughs> my thesaurus. Can we get to my thesaurus so I can yeah. keep saying this? No. But um, his relationships could be problematic. Once you yeah. really get to look at it, he's a therapist for everybody but himself. Mm. And you know, sometimes that can be overbearing to be the person that needs to deal with your friend's problems. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we go over that often. That's good. If you had a daughter, no. <laughs> what? If you had a daughter at his age right now, what's what would be like the main difference in what you're teaching, what you're sharing, what you're saying to them? Wow. Damn, man. I, I, just, came, I just came up with that one off the cuff because I feel like as a man, and then remembering when you were a young a young boy, you can mesh in well with your son. But how the world is now to have a daughter in New York City, a black young woman, yes. how would your parenting change right now? Well, I think I think um, my parenting would my fatherhood would take more of a back seat to my wife's, you know, mm. tutelage, so to speak. I think well, um, with my son, I don't have to take a back seat because I'm essentially raising the next me. Mm. She, she's there. She's very supportive. She's very active. But I'm raising the next me. So if I had a daughter, I would be taking more, a little more of a back seat because the um, the experience of being a woman is only something a woman could could help a young woman with. Yeah. Um, I feel I like be... I feel like the game that the males of the world play is better is better taught I, I from a man. From a man? Mm-hmm. Um yeah, for sure. I would definitely be telling her um I would definitely I would I, I would be probably a little more uh, real than I am with my son to be honest with my daughter like I don't really even have to approach the girl situation like with my son you know like I don't have to give him advice on how to get girls like I'm, I don't I don't want him to even be worried about that mm-hmm. right and he hasn't really he has a girlfriend but it's not like one of those things where it's obsessive mm-hmm. you know it's not like a bunch of little girls and all that so he's a chill dude and she's chill like they yeah. both like just they little they little blurs you know, they're black nerds and they they, <laughs> just, they play video games. I like that. You know, and, and they and they debate on what fictional character would beat the other one and why. Okay. This okay. is what this is what they do, so I'm not too worried okay, about, good. you know, the game. I'm not too worried about the game. <laughs> but if I had a if I had if I had a daughter, uh, my, if I my, if I had a fourteen year old daughter, my son would be fourteen in a couple of weeks or a week. Um, if I had a 14 year old daughter I would definitely uh, 
I would try to Jedi mind trick her into not liking boys. I'm like, you know you can be free. You know, there's nothing wrong with being... Yeah. Um, not, I got I got a lot of my teaching of men from male friends I had around and my brothers. And, my, and one of my uncles that's very open and blunt. Stop bouncing that ball, goddammit. Um, man. Okay. So I had to give you one off the cuff. Uh, nah, that was good. That was good. You were trying to stump me all day. <laughs> what is some advice for a younger black father or a new father um, that would have helped you uh, if you were a young father um, to be aware of and father? Um, don't take it for granted don't take if you have a good woman a woman that's uh, willing to be a stay at home mom while you're working your job or you're working two jobs or you're hustling do not take that shit for granted and do not do not let, let that make you feel like you could be lackadaisical about fatherhood you know be active at all call active um, if you're working overnight it's hard to be active in your kid's life but you gotta make a sacrifice of some of that sleep to be active you need to be there you need to be there to just for the kid the kid needs to feel your energy it's all about balance so the kid the kid needs to feel your energy if you're there you need to be there because there's a lot of kids who grow up and their father was there but they worked so much it was hard for them to actually be there and then this is resentment that the kid doesn't know where it comes from. Mm. And the father definitely doesn't know where it comes from. But a child's mind says, why isn't my father here as much as my mom is here? It doesn't, it doesn't rationalize, well, he does this kind of job that requires him to be outside of the house this many hours. The kid is not going through all of that shit. They're just going to observe and feel. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's why we, people who have fathers like that um, when they get to adulthood and they have kids, that's when they understand. But you're missing a whole gap of time when a relationship could have been made because you got, um, what's the word? You got this animosity because you was never around, you never cared. But it was like, I cared enough to provide this. Yeah, and I thought yeah. that that was more important than sitting on the couch with you and playing games. Yeah, and it's, it's not, it's not more important. I know as adults, we're adulting and everybody got to get paid on time, monthly and all of that, but work-life balance is essential. And um, we should have learned that from this quarantine. How often do you travel with your son? Um, we haven't traveled in actually a few years. We've been like super local. Um, last time we see. traveled, we went to Philly. I gotta go somewhere. We went to um, your hometown. Yes. I think it's essential for black men to take their black son out of the country at least once a year. Mm. Because. And that's alone, just man and son. Just man and son, because for you to see how your child adapts to a completely different culture it gives them more humbleness when they come home and they're less bothered by someone telling them who they are or what they are or what they're capable of because they've seen mm -hmm. different they've experienced different and when they see black people quote unquote because you're only black when you're in the united states um, when they see black people in other countries that look like them but speak a different language or are um, super self-efficient where they can climb trees and get this or, or their kids working in the street and being mm -hmm. mindful of their, their being cars and they see that child with no shoes and not concerned about labels on them but they are about this money and they go home and their 
excitement is the fact that they get to play soccer in this field that's just full of dirt. And they come home and they have all these things where they have grass, they have games, they have electricity, all of it. It's a it's a much more appreciation for that. And kids, yeah. kid, American kids need to be humbled, and they're not. Um, Facts. So yeah, make if, if if it's not a thing, I know this COVID is messing it up for a lot of. No, that's I, you know I never even. And you know what? I should have thought of that because that's how I learned about life. I traveled as a kid and it wasn't necessarily with my dad. It was with my organization, with the choir. But mm-hmm. I got to see people who looked like me who who were not like me necessarily because they're yeah. from where they're from. But it, it, it gave me a sense of um, belonging in the world. Mm-hmm. And then when you come back, you get to appreciate what you do have, yeah. you know. No, but I'm, you know what? I'm on that. I'm on yeah. that. Yeah. I'm waiting, I'm waiting for Ari to um, probably, after she turns four, I'll take them once a year to go travel out of the country. Because I don't want them to feel like they this live. Is it. Yeah, I don't want them to feel like this is it. This is the ceiling. I don't want them to feel like. Um, uh, life is easy. All I gotta do is want it and uh, tell Amazon to order it, and you could just pay for it, and I have it at my door. I don't want them to feel like this is life because that's not life. Um, so the humbleness is coming. Uh, <laughs> um, my next question for you is: What can women, children, and other family members or friends do to help combat? the negativity that black fathers get in your opinion say our names the same way we bring we in order to bring you know acknowledgement and uh awareness to black people who are you know yeah just inhumanely killed at the hands of police officers you you say their names Mm -hmm. say your father's name speak about your father talk about the good experiences with your father like change the narrative that fathers are just ornamental pieces at best like you know um, and if your father if you feel like your father is ornamental if you hold us to task yeah, that's the thing hold us accountable too because there's some men who are just going to be ornamental because we may not have had fathers to show us how to be active mm. so if, if we don't know how to be active uh, active and supportive fathers because we didn't have it and we're not you know putting the dots together to figure out how to be not like our father if we're not getting it hold us to task but acknowledge us just keep us in your in your thoughts and in your speech because everybody likes a mama done told me type of story like mama <laughs> told me my mama told me long ago yeah I was like yo I hear you I hear you but what did your father say yeah I just want to know. I'm just being curious, like you know. Or a lot of people do this, man. My mama done came over here this weekend. She cooked me this. She did this. She fixed this. Yeah, like. But nobody says nothing about their dad coming to their house to fix their the car <laughs> with the light or or fixing the sink. Or my brother came here the other day because there's no man in my life, and I got like this door, um, this door it kind of stops people from like kicking in the door and I needed him to drill it in and stuff so he left his shop where he has hella clients you know that need to come in with their cars and stuff came here drilled it in made sure it was secure and then he went back to work but not only did he come this man brought donuts for for these girls in here as if they need the sugar but it's just the fact that like I can call you you own your own business, you're working, you'll leave work, come to my house, do something for me, um, leave, and I show you my appreciation, you show me your appreciation, and I appreciate it. Can't nobody say nothing bad about my brother when it comes to your needs and the time that he may take. You might be late, but he might do it. 
do it. So yeah, I agree with that. That's a song. Um. Ooh, I'm trying to. Say, I want to ask you one more. Well, I'm trying to ask you something where you gonna body that. <laughs> I didn't body any of these. This I mean, you did. The you did. You did. I like to prepare. No, I don't. Uh, I hate preparation. All right. This is a yes or no question. All right. Um, can a mother solely raise her son to be a well-balanced father without a father present? Yes or no? Uh, yes. If there's a support system, like if she has brothers who are there and who are willing to like carry some of the burden that's left you know when the father is not there she absolutely can it takes a village like it's, it's, me and my wife can't just do it alone mm-hmm. you know it's, there's family members who've who've been there to babysit who've been there to you know just to watch over us and watch over him mm-hmm. so you know if you have a good support system if you have quality men around mm-hmm. yes absolutely I agree. Love it. Um, that is all I got for you, man. That is all I got for you. Yes, but I feel like Pokemon. I... Gotta catch them all. <laughs> if Anya saw that she would trip, she loves Pokemon. No, she cannot see me <laughs> doing drugs. No, I I feel like you you had to adult young so you had to you had to grab life for what it actually was at a young age after your dad passed yeah but like 14 like, 15 yeah I feel like that has like triumphed you in fatherhood because now you have a a deeper understanding of what change could do a lot earlier so you're more intentional about it and everything that you acquired as far as like the knowledge the teaching um you remembering your challenges you're gonna pour into your son and thank you for that because sometimes boys who grew up and however they lost a father or a father wasn't there they have this animosity where they have children and then they hold back what they can pour in because they didn't have anybody at a certain point so you could have learned how to deal with life and not have it and that's the wrong attitude to have so just thank you for taking that on the flip side and making it work and making it better and aiming to be better for your son because that is your life asset your children are your assets. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I wish people would do more to treat them that way. But thank you for being excellent. Oh, man, thank you. Man. I, nobody asks me questions, so this is fun. <laughs> nobody, no, too. listen, that's the thing. Nobody cares. <laughs> I care. I always cared. And um, I always wonder, like, what's my fascination with, like, old men or old people? And it's it's Damn. the uh, you, what, what are you saying? It's the cur- I'm saying? telling you, like it's the curiosity. Damn. It's the no, it's My the curiosity own? of what wisdom they carry. So, like, yeah. let's say if your father was alive, I would be very interested in asking your father about his perspective on life or thus mm-hmm. far. Like for my college thesis, I um, I interviewed my grandfather about life. And uh, this man only had a um, an eighth grade education, and then after eighth grade, this man was just working in the street for his family. Uh, was a father to fourteen kids. Whoa! And you know, built the house in Jamaica. The house is still there. I still got family there, and just like when you know the dynamic of what makes the that man in your life that man your life is a much easier and that's why I did it so um, yeah you guys are important so I always go out my way to make fathers know their importance black men know that they're important 
that their life is a chance to change it however they feel it needs to be changed. Um, so that's where I was going with the fascination of old men. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That's, no, that's, listen, it's all good. I'm old. It's all clean good. Clean out and clean it up. <laughs> I, I feel, I feel young, but I'm, it's all good. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm vintage. God damn it. <laughs> I tell people, you know, nah, old, thirty-five you see. is young. Yeah, thirty-five is still young. We, we yes. this world is different. Yes. The way I see these fifty-year-olds acting, oh, I'm only twelve because listen. they're acting like children. Listen. So. Some of these 40 year olds are children. Oh yeah. So, my dad yeah. my dad had me at 60 with my mom. And in his 70s and 80s, he was still getting numbers, okay? So wait, uh, wait, hold on, wait. What? How old were your parents when they had you? <laughs> my mom was 30 and my dad was 60. Yeah. You know, Jamaican Jamaican men swag. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. But uh I wanna say happy Father's Day if uh you don't hear or you don't feel it or it doesn't really mean much. Happy Father's Day because it means a lot. It means a lot to me. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Please follow us. Follow us as in me <laughs> at Cozy Womb Pod on Twitter. Please follow the Facebook page at Cozy Womb Podcast. I need some feedback about these episodes. Um, I've been doing episodes since 2018. I want to say March. And um, I feel like in 2018 it was a lot more feedback that I was getting from the episodes and now I'm kind of really wondering like what do parents or soon-to-be parents or listeners um, need from like other parents or what do you want to know or um, what are you mostly uh, curious about um, that you would like to be talked about um, that's not talked about enough and uh, if I can if I have an experience with it I would love to share it I'm really curious on what it is what is it that I haven't shared or I haven't done an episode I feel like I've touched basis on most things the only thing that I haven't touched base on um, purposely is um, women who have had miscarriages because I've never experienced that. Um, And I don't like to do episodes on things I haven't experienced because I don't know what that's like. But um, if you guys would want to share any feedback, please um, check out the Cozy Woman Podcast Facebook page and uh, the Twitter. DM me on IG at Cozy Woman Pod. Uh, I answer my DMs frequently. Um, If there's any podcasters out there or anyone that's interested in any type of um, branding of their, you know, product, uh, I don't mind adding it into the show if that's something you're interested in. Just please email me at CozyWombMama at gmail.com. Hope you guys enjoy the show. Would love your feedback. If this is a show that you're interested in, please subscribe. And please leave a review on Apple Podcast app. Thank you. Bye. 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 Have you ever felt the pull of mystery? Introducing Seeker's Notes, a classic hidden object game. Seeker's Notes isn't just another game. It's a premium hobby with no ads, no Wi-Fi needed, and it's completely free. Over 40 million fans have already been captivated by its charm. So why not come see what it's all about? Download Seeker's Notes now for free and see for yourself.